Okay, let's turn our focus now to the Democratic Party with the election results settled. Party members are trying to figure out what went wrong. To talk about this, we are joined now by Matt Bennett. He is a co-founder of the Third Way, a U.S. Pol a public policy think tank, joining us from Arlington, Virginia tonight. Thanks for being here, Matt. Thank you. Uh, Bernie Sanders put out a statement a short time ago, uh, and he said, it should come as no great surprise that a democratic party which has abandoned working class people would find that the working class has abandoned them. What do you make of that statement and that assessment from Bernie Sanders? You know, Bernie Sanders has been in public life since the early 70s, and he has never changed his tune. He says the same thing, rain or shine. And so I was not surprised to hear that from Senator Sanders, but I have to say it's completely tone deaf. If you look at what happened in this election, we got wiped out, you know, pretty much everywhere. Donald Trump increased his margins in almost every American county. Uh, that means New York City and rural parts of Montana and everything in between. And so to say that we need to go farther left when the electorate was choosing to go right, I think is completely tone deaf. I mean, is that what he said though? I mean, it, like he, he's saying that the, the party has abandoned working class folks. Um, so I guess where do you think things went wrong? Because some of these key demographics that we heard for so long from uh, you know Democratic analysts and from the party itself and Kamala Harris's campaign that were going to come out clearly came out, but they just didn't vote for that candidate. Right, and I think the reason I say that Bernie was wanting us to go farther left is because that's all that he ever says. He what he was saying was we abandoned working class folks by not giving them more by not making government larger. But what actually happened, if you look at you know, the, the demographics that we lost and you look at some of the exit polls, we don't have all the data yet, of course, but what we do know is that voters were very angry about a number of things. Immigration, as we just heard in, in the previous spot, mm -hmm. uh, they were ang very angry about inflation and they didn't like what they were hearing from Democrats on kind of a host of culture issues in part they just don't want to be, they don't want their speech to be policed. They don't want to be told that they're bad people or racists or bigots. And whether it was fair or not, that's what they thought they were hearing from Democrats. And so do you think that uh, the, the, the tone and the talking point in terms of Donald Trump's character, uh, we, we heard a lot about, you, you know, he is going to uh, have a political hit list in terms of his political enemies when he walks in. It's all going to be about retribution. The demonizing of Donald Trump, do you think that that turned some voters off? I don't think that anyone was voting for Trump to kind of defend his honor. Everyone knows that Trump is not a trustworthy guy. In my view, he's a very bad person with mm -hmm. a lot of very bad ideas. But uh, what I think they were responding to was less about Trump himself and more about how they felt uh, Democrats were treating them. They, I think they felt like they were being patronized and looked down on and lectured. And that is just not an attractive look for, for a political party or for political leaders. I don't think Kamala Harris herself was guilty of any of those things, but it's built into the Democratic brand. And, and so do you think that that is a fair criticism, the, the patronizing, the, 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 the you know, I, I was watching, I think it was The View, uh, and they were doing analysis, and I, I think one of the talking points was like, okay, well, it's, it was uh, uneducated folks. Right. I, so I, I wonder if you think that there is some um, uh, some value there to that uh, idea that perhaps uh, it was a patronizing campaign. Yes. I mean, not again, not the Harris campaign itself, but I think generally speaking, the left in our country, that is the Democratic Party and all of its allies, not all, but many of its allies, treat people who have not gone to college as somehow failures in life. But that's a big problem because only 28% of American adults have a four-year degree. 72% do not. Mm -hmm. And so we are treating the vast majority of Americans like they're second-class citizens and they know it. So you don't think that the campaign did that though? No, I don't think so. And, and if you look at the messaging coming from the vice president herself, from her surrogates mostly, and from the commercials that she was running, 
you didn't see any of that. But the problem for her is she was only running for three months. Yeah. She was inheriting a Democratic brand that had been kind of festering in this problem for many years. And, and I don't think there was anything she could have done to escape that. Mm -hmm. uh, you, we were just uh, had video up while, while you were answering there of Oprah Winfrey. I think it was in Philadelphia the night before uh, the election coming out uh, with Kamala Harris. We saw Beyonce. We saw Lady Gaga. Um, Cardi B, uh, all of these different celebrities, Taylor Swift uh, endorsed. Do, do you think that helped or hurt ultimately the Harris campaign? Because uh, I have been listening to some pundits who said these celebrities are not relatable to av everyday average Americans. You know, it's so hard to know. I, I don't think it, it's a problem when a celebrity endorses your candidate, but I don't think relying upon that celebrity for anything makes any sense. I mean, I, I remember John Kerry doing events with Bruce Springsteen. Hillary Clinton did the same. Uh, didn't work for either of them. But on the other hand, you know, celebrity endorsements didn't hurt Barack Obama. Uh, so my guess is it's mostly a wash. What I do think, though, is that the way the campaign related to other kinds of celebrities, particularly online personalities like Joe Rogan, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, in, in retrospect, she probably should have done that interview. So when the, so, and, and of course, uh, Donald Trump did that interview, and I think it's up to like 90-something million views. Uh, so when right. the, 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 the leadership of this party, um, when, when folks uh, that are huge within the Democratic Party, like uh, the former President Obama uh, and, and others, and, and Hillary Clinton, uh, and ultimately Kamala Harris and Joe Biden, uh, look at what has happened and the Democratic Party does some soul searching. What do you think they will need to do so that in four years from now, they can connect to the issues that are important to Americans in, in a, a way that will get them a victory? Well, I think the, the context matters enormously. And Donald Trump is about to become president again. And uh, he's going to do so without any of the guardrails that kind of hemmed him in the first time. So I think you're going to see a much more aggressive, chaotic presidency than you saw the first time around. Mm -hmm. And that will set the stage for our politics for the next four years. But Democrats need to spend the next couple of years before the midterm elections thinking carefully about how we are communicating to the vast majority of voters, because they just told us they didn't like what they were hearing from us. Some of it is situational. Some of it's about inflation that is going to be, you know, gone or Trump's problem by then. But some of it isn't. And we better deal with the deeper problems. OK, Matt, uh, we've got to leave it there for now. Much more analysis to do in the days ahead. Uh, but appreciate that tonight. That is Matt Bennett, who is a co-founder of Third Way, a U.S. public policy think tank, joining us from Arlington.